Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, it's 11.15. Um, I am going to uh, start sharing the next uh, paper topic session, which is structural Phillips curves. And we have a lot of really exciting papers on here. And uh, as a reminder, same rules as before apply. Please put all your questions into the chat and we will answer them after the presentations. And each speaker is about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, and uh, I would uh, then pass the uh, floor to you, Ludwig. Um, please, uh, the floor is yours. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, I can. And can you okay, share? Let me try to uh, share my slides. Awesome. You can see it? Okay, great. My cursor, you, you can see too, probably. But um, yes, okay, so wonderful. Yes. Um, great. Well, thank you very much uh, for putting our paper uh, on the program. Uh, this paper is called New Pricing Models, Same Old Phillips Curve. Um, it's joint work with uh, Adrian O'Claire, uh, Rodolfo Rigato, who is a fantastic grad student here at Harvard, and uh, Matt Rongley. So the starting point for this project, the very basic question in monetary economics, namely, um, how should we model the Phillips curve for prices? And there's two classes of models that are commonly used to model the Phillips curve. And those are the time dependent models, such as the Calvo model. Those are typically tractable and they're easy to implement in richer DSGE models. So for example, I put here the standard New Keynesian Phillips curve that we all uh, know and love. And then the second class of models uh, that uh, um, people have been using more recently are state-dependent models, such as a standard menu cost models. Uh, these models typically offer a better microfit, but are harder to simulate, especially in GE contexts. And that's why mostly the literature has focused on characterizing the impulse response of the nominal price level to permanent nominal marginal costs rather than say real marginal cost shock. And so what we want to do in this project is very simple. We want to compute the analog of the New Keynes and Phillips curve for menu cost models. So what do we mean by Phillips curve for menu cost models? Essentially, what we mean is we want to characterize the first order relationship between any given shock to real marginal costs and uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, re inflation rates that result from that. So any such first order mapping can be uh, thought of as a linear equation when we stack all the shocks to real marginal costs into a vector and all the resulting inflation rates into a vector, then we can write any such first order mapping as uh, a linear equation where uh, we, have to comp we have to multiply the marginal cost shocks with some matrix J, okay? That matrix, is what we're going to call a Phillips curve Jacobian, and that will be exactly our notion of a Phillips curve. Notice that the NKPC corresponds to a specific J, as I'm going to show you, and we're going to compute this J for menu cost models. And once this J is computed, any given shock sequence to real marginal cost can be fed into this equation, and we can get uh, the resulting impulse response of inflation out of that. So armed with this Phillips curve Jacobian, we then have three main results in this paper. First, we're gonna show that the new, the equivalent, the analog of the new Keynes and Phillips curve for the menu cost model looks numerically nearly identical to the actual NKPC coming from a Calvo model. Um, and, and, and second, we're gonna show you that there's an exact equivalence result not to a Calvo model, but to a mixture of two time-dependent models. So that gives us a very close link between state-dependent and time-dependent models. And third, I'm gonna not have much time to spend on this, but in the paper, we also have a result that uh, shows one how we can use the distribution of price changes alone to compute the Phillips curve Jacobian without even even having to simulate the menu cost model. So just given with data on the distribution of price changes, we can back out what the Phillips curve Jacobian of a menu cost model has to be. And then once we know that Jacobian, we can obviously uh, 
hit the economy with arbitrary real marginal cost shocks and we'll always get what the predicted inflation rates are. So we could, for example, easily embed that in a DSG. Perfect, I'm gonna go straight to the details. So I'm going to uh, introduce the two classes of models first, and then we're gonna analyze their predictions for the Phillips curve. Great, I'm gonna uh, uh, introduce random menu cost models first. We're gonna do that in discrete time. We're gonna use a standard quadratic approximation to the firm objective function. So here, the uh, firms are minimizing a uh, cost and the cost uh, consists of two components. The first component essentially corresponds to the, uh, a cost from having the current price PIT deviate from the optimal price, which consists of an idiosyncratic random walk component, as well as the aggregate shift in nominal marginal costs. And the second component of this cost function corresponds to the menu costs that have to be paid when the prices change, okay? And those menu costs we allow to be random, coming from a two-point distribution. They're either zero, in which case uh, uh, there's a free adjustment, or they're equal to a constant. And we're gonna parametrize the probability of a free adjustment by lambda. Now this lambda allows us then to distinguish two special cases that have been uh, used extensively in the literature of these models. Um, the first is the first is the Gauss of Lucas model in which uh, there are no free adjustments. So lambda is zero. And the second is the Nakamura-Steinson model or the Calvo plus model in which uh, lambda is positive. Now, once we solve this problem for all individual firms and get all their individual price paths, we can then aggregate these price paths up and get the path of aggregate uh, uh, um, prices. And we also can get the path of aggregate inflation by just differencing the path of price. Now, if you take look at this, uh, this model from sort of a bird's eye perspective, you see that really the only aggregate shock here in the firm problem is the, uh, the changes in nominal marginal cost. Once we know those changes, once we know the path of nominal marginal cost that we feed into this problem, we can then solve all the firm individual problems and then uh, back out what the, the response, uh, uh, the responding uh, path of aggregate prices and inflation is. So in some sense, you can view this as a mapping from the path of nominal marginal cost to the path of the price level. And that mapping we're gonna use extensively in a second. Now, the second class of models that I wanna introduce are general time dependent models. So in those models, adjustment is not subject to a cost and cannot be chosen. Instead, it's given by exogenous adjustment probabilities. We're gonna parametrize them as follows. So after S periods, we're gonna note the probability of not having adjusted yet, of sort of surviving by phi S. And then when a firm gets to adjust, it solves the following simple cost minimization where there's now only, only one term left, um, namely the uh, deviation from the firm's optimal price. And we have to discount that now with the survival probabilities of Vs. Now, Calvo has a very distinct pattern of survival probabilities that are just exponentially declining at the rate of the constant uh, Calvo, uh, con uh, uh, constant Calvo adjustment hazards, uh, which we're all also going to know by them. But this description of a time-dependent model obviously also nests other time-dependent models, such as models that have increasing adjustment hazards, like Cattell. Now, in both of these classes of models, um, we're gonna assume that they're in a steady state, and then we're gonna feed into both of these models a MIT shock to nominal marginal cost, okay? This is a perfect foresight shock. And as I already mentioned, in both of these models, we can get the resulting uh, uh, path of aggregate prices essentially uh, as a function of this shock. Okay, that's the only thing we need to know. Once we have the shock, we can figure out what the path of aggregate prices is. And what we're interested in in this uh, paper is the first order behavior of this mapping. So in particular, what happens when we feed in small nominal marginal cost shocks around the steady state? So if we expand this mapping to first order, we're gonna get that the first order shift in aggregate prices in response to the nominal marginal cost shock is given by this linear some here where the coefficients essentially correspond to the entries of a derivative of a Jacobian matrix that, uh, that essentially capture how the price level at a given point in time responds to changes in marginal cost at a potentially given 
different period in time. Okay, so by varying T and S, we can get uh, uh, all the entries in this matrix, which we're gonna call nominal price Jacobian, J naught, okay? And by then stacking the impulse response of prices into a vector and stacking this shock process, nominal, this nominal marginal cost shock process into a vector, we can write this entire equation in vector terms. So we get that the vector of the price impulse response is equal to this nominal price Jacobian times uh, nominal uh, marginal cost, uh, the nominal marginal cost vector. So why is this useful? Once I've computed the nominal price Jacobian for a given model, let's say a menu cost model, then I can hit this with arbitrarily shaped nominal marginal cost shocks, and I don't have to resolve the model. I just keep that J num. So in some sense, it's a sufficient statistic for the behavior of the pricing model at hand. Now, what intuitively does this matrix correspond to? So column S of that matrix corresponds to the impulse response of the aggregate price level to a small aggregate nominal cost shock that hits at date S and that is known sort of at date zero already, okay? Now, um, as I mentioned, um, we can use this to feed in arbitrarily shaped shocks to nominal marginal cost. One common one that the literature on many cost models has used is a permanent shift in nominal marginal costs. For example, if I increase nominal margin costs by one unit forever, then this uh, uh, corresponds here to an MC vector of one, and we can compute the resulting impulse response of the price level by just multiplying this nominal price Jacobian uh, uh, matrix with a vector of one. In a special case of, of a model that's very, very simple, it's obviously a model with flexible prices. And in that case, this nominal price Jacobian will correspond to an identity matrix because the change in aggregate prices will always be exactly equal to the change in nominal marginal cost in every period. Great, let me show you an example of what that looks like for a model we all know, the Calvo model. So let's look at the, uh, the uh, blue lines here, especially the one around quarter 20. So this corresponds to the column 20 of the Calvo model's nominal price Jacobian. So you see that it's highest in the quarter of the shock, but it already rises in anticipation of the shock that happens just at quarter 20. And after the shock is over, we sort of fall back towards uh, a price level of zero uh, or price level back to steady state price level uh, in this uh, shock. Now, the other blue lines correspond to other columns of this Jacobian. And if we were to change the frequency of the Calvo model and made it more flexible, we tend to get more you know, squished together, more spikier columns of this uh, Jacobian matrix. Now, um, what if instead of uh, feeding in a nominal marginal cost shock, I want to feed in a real marginal cost shock. Now, real marginal costs are essentially, in log terms, the difference between nominal marginal cost and the endogenous response of the price level. So I can just plug this into the equation I already showed you, and I end up with a fixed point equation where the price level now enters both the left and the right-hand side, which I can use sort of linear algebra to solve. And then I get an expression for the price level that now uh, uh, tells me how it responds to real marginal rather than nominal marginal cost shocks. Now, if we want to know inflation, which is what the Phillips curve typically tells us, I can simply first difference this equation and get that the impulse response of inflation, again, stacked as a vector over time, is simply a matrix times the real marginal cost shock vector over time. And that matrix is what we're gonna call J, and that's gonna be our Phillips curve Jacobian. And just to emphasize, pretty much any pricing model will be able, to, will, will give us such a J, will give us such a Phillips curve Jacobian that just characterizes for arbitrary real marginal cost shocks what the first order response of inflation is. So this is like the generalization of the NKPC to arbitrary pricing models, including menu cost uh, models. Now, again, what does this look like, this Phillips curve Jacobian for the Calvo model, which we know. So again, let's look at the blue lines. These are columns of this Phillips curve Jacobian. Um, now, uh, what does this, for example, this blue line around quarter 20 uh, tell us? So that's the impulse response of inflation 
to a one-time shock that hits at quarter 20 to real marginal cost. Now, this number here is simply kappa, because if you look at this equation, if there's no movement in inflation in the future, a unit real marginal cost shock at quarter 20 just gives you kappa. And as we go backwards in time towards uh, um, uh, quarter zero, we end up uh, having to discount that sort of impact response by kappa uh, um, by however many periods we went into the past. So this gives us this shape for the inflation response to a unit marginal, real marginal cost shock at different dates. And again, if we made the model more flexible, we'd see that this, uh, this response increases so that you know, the inflation rate is more responsive to real marginal cost shock. Great. All right, so this introduces these two Jacobians, the nominal price Jacobian linking nominal marginal cost to the nominal price level, and the Phillips curve Jacobian linking real marginal cost to inflation. Now we want to compute both of these objects, both of these Jacobians for uh, many cost models. And to do that, we're going to obviously have to calibrate many cost models. We're going to do that in a very standard way. So I'm not going to bore you with the details here. And we're going to do that for both the Gullis of Lucas and the Nakamura Steinson model. Now, when we use these, these two calibrated menu cost models to compute the nominal price Jacobians, this is what we find. So these are the columns of the nominal price Jacobians of these two models. You see, first of all, that they kind of look like these hen-shaped figures that we already saw already for uh, the Calvo model, but they're a bit different, right? The Gullis of Lucas model, for example, has higher values, spikes, more, it's more squished together relative to the Nakamura Steinson model, which is more broader, more wider. And if you think back to what I told you about the Calvo model, you see that this already suggests that the Gauls of Lucas model is going to have less monetary non neutrality, it's sort of closer to this flexible price a benchmark compared to uh, the Nakamura Steinson model. Now, these look like Calvo shapes, but is there any way to sort of formally see how close they are to? Uh, the class of Calvo models. And to do that, we need some kind of distance metric to, uh, to tell us you know, how close, so to speak, is a Calvo model to uh, these menu cost models. To do that, we're going to use a very simple distance metric. We're essentially just going to take the difference between these Jacobians for menu cost models and the Calvo implied Jacobians. And we're going to compute the operator norm of this distance between of this uh, difference between the matrices that corresponds to the standard sort of Euclidean uh, 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 vector norm. And that allows us to evaluate how close these Jacobians are. There's a very natural interpretation of why that's a natural uh, distance metric to look at. I'm happy to go into details later in the q and if, if you're interested. But for now, this is just the metric we used. We use different ones as well in the paper and, and you get very similar results. And so we're going to use this distance metric and then find the Calvo model with a specific Calvo parameter that best approximates any given menu cost model. So once we do that, in dashed red, you see what we end up with. You see that in both of these cases, by picking a specific Calvo adjustment frequency, we're able to closely approximate the menu cost model Phillips, uh, the menu cost model nominal price Jacobian columns. Okay. And so this suggests. For nominal marginal cost shocks, these menu cost models behave almost exactly like a Calvo model would behave with a given uh, a Calvo adjustment frequency. Now, what about Phillips curve Jacobians that we're really interested in? Um, so this is what the Phillips curve Jacobians look like for the Gullis of Lucas and the Nakamura Steinson model. As expected, the level is a bit higher for the Gullis of Lucas model compared to the Nakamura Steinson model, again, because Gullis of Lucas model is uh, more flexible. And once we approximate both of those Jacobians with the Calvo Phillips curve, we see that again, the Calvo model provides a very good fit to both of these uh, uh, Phillips curve Jacobians. So again, this suggests that if you have your favorite model, let's say a Smets and Wilders model, and you would like to use the Phillips curve implied by a menu cost model, all that you have to do is you have to figure out what the kappa is that corresponds to your menu cost model. And then you can use your standard NKPC uh, in the context of, say, your Smets and Wilders model and, and run with that, and you're going to get almost the exact same result for uh, every aggregate that you look at in the Smets and Wilders model. Now, one obstacle you might see here is that, oh, well, 
I kind of have to compute this first before I can approximate it with a Calvo model and figure out what kappa I should use in my NKPC. Well, it turns out that there's a nice way to get close uh, to get at a, the approximating kappa for the Calvo model that uses a recent result by Alvarez to Behan Lippi. They have a sufficient statistic for comparing cumulative impulse responses of uh, a Calvo in the menu cost model, and that sufficient statistic is this kurtosis frequency ratio. And using their result, you can back out a kappa that corresponds to closely corresponds to the best approximating Calvo kappa to a given menu cost model, and you just basically need to figure out what the kurtosis frequency ratio is that uh, your menu cost model is calibrated to, and then you can back out what the kappa is that you want to use in the NKPC. Great. All right, now this is a numerical equivalence result. You might wonder how specific is this to these specific models. We've thrown a lot of stuff at this equivalence result and it, it's very hard to break. So even arbitrary parameters, you still get similar pictures, steady Z inflation, infrequent shocks, et cetera. Um, and, and so this is a fairly broad, uh, broad uh, numerical equivalence result. Still, uh, we kind of uh, wanted to go further and wanted to see if there's an exact equivalent somewhere in the neighborhood of this numerical equivalence result. And it turns out that there's no exact equivalence, not to a Calvo model and also not to a time-dependent model. So many cost models are not like simple time-dependent models. But we came up with the following result, which I think is, is quite neat. Namely that any random many cost model has the exact same aggregate implications for prices and inflation as the mixture of two time-dependent models. So what do I mean by that? If you take a population of price setters, you split them into two groups and you give them, allow them to have different, uh, or behave according to different time-dependent uh, um, survival probabilities, adjustment probabilities, then if you aggregate their pricing behavior, their inflation behavior, then they're gonna have exactly the same and so you could choose these adjustment probabilities so that on aggregate, this model has the exact same predictions for prices and inflation as any given random menu cost model. Now, I'm not going to have time to go through the proof of this result or, 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 or show you exactly what these adjustment uh, probabilities look like, the survival probabilities of these time-dependent blocks, but I am want to give you some intuition why two and why uh, time-dependent models. So these two time-dependent models essentially correspond to the different margins through which the marginal cost shock matters for pricing behavior. So the first time-dependent block here corresponds to how uh, to the extensive margin uh, uh, that uh, through which the shock matters, right? The SS band shift in a random menu cost model, and that will give us the first you know time-dependent model that corresponds to that margin through which the shock hits. The second is the intensive margin, right? The recent point shifts in response to a marginal cost shock. And that will give us sort of the second, the second time dependent model that, uh, that we have in this equation. Now, what are these survival rates? I'm not gonna have time to, to go through that, but they're related to a very interesting object, namely to expected future price gaps given in some initial price gap. And once you have that object, uh, uh, computed for a menu cost model, you can easily read off from that sort of steady state menu cost model object what these survival rates for the two menu cost, uh, for the two, uh, sorry, for the two time dependent models are. Let me just check how much time I have. Uh, perfect. Um, I'm going to uh, be wrapping up in a second. Um, just as maybe the last plot I'm going to show you, if you plot these. Uh, uh, survival rates for the intensive and extensive margin blocks, you see that neither of the two really looks like an exponential. So neither of the two time dependent blocks is really like a Calvo, but it turns out when you average the two, according to the weights, you end up with basically an exponential. And that explains why the Calvo approximation to, uh, uh, to the menu cost model Phillips curve works so well because these intensive and extensive margin basically uh, uh, average to an exponential to a couple. We have generalizations of this in the paper where we do this for general uh, menu cost distributions. I'm not gonna have time to go into this. We also have a result that allows us to uh, back out the Phillips curve of a, uh, a, a, of a menu cost model uh, 
based entirely on the price change uh, distribution. All right, let me conclude. So the whole purpose, sole purpose of this paper is to compute the Phillips curve that corresponds to menu cost models. And then we have seen that uh, these are observation equivalent to uh, a standard NKPC for a given uh, a Phillips curve slope kappa. Um, and that makes them easy to embed in these three models, especially with a sufficient statistic formula for the kappa. And finally, I've tried to argue that um, the pricing behavior of menu cost models is theoretically equivalent to the mixture, to the pricing behavior of a mixture of two time dependent models. Oops, thanks very much for uh, your attention and I look forward to your comments. Yeah, thank you very much, Ludwig. Um, this was very, very exciting. So let's pass uh, on the baton to Michelle. All right, so thanks a lot to the organizers for including this paper uh, on the program. I am a uh, PhD student at Oxford, and this is my job market paper this year. So what motivates this research agenda I'm following is the consensus we've had in monetary economics and in macro in general over the last couple of decades that we should use monetary policy or central bank tools to manage business cycle fluctuations. But something that got us interested a bit more recently is whether or not we can use those tools in the same way across different states of the world. And empirical evidence suggests that it's not the case. In particular, work by Tereira and Twitis has found that the same monetary shock which happens in a recession has a much smaller effect in GDP than the same shock happening in expansion. And some subsequent work by Oscar Jordan and co-authors also has found that the same shock happening in a state of the world with uh, loose credit has much more ability to affect GDP than the same shock happening in a state with tight credit. And finally, some very recent work by Guido Ascari and Timo Haber has found that as you increase the size of the shock, the response that you get from GDP becomes less than proportionate. So you're running out of steam effectively as you increase the size of the shock. So all three of those are clearly very empirically relevant and policy relevant. But unfortunately, the sort of uh, models that tend to be used in the profession, so even the most sophisticated fully nonlinear uh, medium scale New Keynesian models, have trouble matching any of those nonlinearities observed in the data. And this mismatch between even the most sophisticated fully nonlinear medium scale models and the empirically documented nonlinearities is what motivates this paper. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a novel tractable framework to rationalize a range of nonlinearities in the transmission of monetary shocks. And the key novel mechanism, which I'm going to introduce, will find a lot of support in the data, both aggregates and micro. So in particular, what I'm doing is I'm developing a sticky price and the Keynesian model with input output linkages. So there's nothing particularly novel about the first two bits. But the key novelty is that the input output linkages in the model will be formed endogenously as decisions made by firms. And this endogenous formation of networks makes input output linkages state dependent in my world. So they will vary across states of the world. And as a result, there'll be a completely new theoretical mechanism. Namely that states of the world with dense networks with a lot of linkages will feature strong complementarities in price setting. So in state of the world where every firm is buying more from other firms in, in the economy, it's effectively inheriting stickiness, price stickiness from those firms, which strengthens monetary non-neutrality. And of course, in states of the world with not many linkages, the opposite happens. So complementarity in price setting weakens. And as I'll show, this novel empirical mechanism can help rationalize at least the three nonlinearities uh, that I've mentioned on the previous slide. So in particular, in my model, there'll be cycle dependence, namely the response of GDP to a monetary shock, the magnitude of the response will be pro-cyclical. Why? Because in expansionary states of the world with high productivity, all firms will want to benefit from the high productivity and hence from the low prices charged by suppliers connect to more suppliers, there'll be more non-neutrality of money as a result. Second, there'll be path dependence. So the effect of any monetary intervention on GDP will be stronger 
whenever it happens in aftermath of a previous loose policy. Why? Because after periods of loose policy, prices are adjusting uh, by less than the wages, which encourages more connections to more suppliers and strengthens non neutrality in the future. And finally, there'll be size dependence. So large and small shocks will, tr will transmit differently. Why? Because large monetary expansions will encourage more linkages, which will amplify the effect on GDP, whereas large monetary contractions will break the network, remove linkages, and weaken the effect on GDP relative to the fixed network benchmark. So there'll be size dependence, but it will be varying depending on the size of the sign of the shock. And crucially, you're getting the size dependent results even in the limit of purely, purely time dependent pricing. So you don't need many costs or any state dependencies in the probability of uh, price resetting to generate standard state dependency, uh, size dependency, even uh, in, in that limit, as long as network are formed endogenously. And finally, I will show you novel model free evidence on network cyclicality, on how the shape of the network responds to both real and monetary shocks. And uh, those will be consistent with my model. So in the time that I've got today, I will give you a very simplified exposition of my model with only two periods. So in period one, prices are going to be sticky, whereas in period two, they're going to be uh, flexible. And in, in the paper, there's an extension to a full infinite horizon model with a numerical solution technique, but for now, I'll keep things simple. So as a brief overview, on the firm side, there will be K sectors with a continuum of firms in every sector, and they'll be making active decisions whether or not to connect to each other. On the household side, everything is going to be very standard. There'll be a continuum of households supplying labor to those firms. So that's just kind of a basic model structure slide. In terms of more detail, as I said, there'll be K sectors with a continuum of firms in each. And each of those firms in every sector will have access to a Cobb Douglas production technology, which depends on firstly a productivity term. So SK is the set of sectors they choose to buy from, and AK is the exogenously given mapping from your choice of suppliers, SK, and uh, the level of productivity that you're getting. Then they're using labor and intermediate input. With every task they need to perform to produce their good, there's an associated cost share omega KR. And they can choose to either outsource this task to other firms, in which case this share appears on the intermediate inputs, or if they choose not to outsource, they'll have to do that in-house, in which case that share appears in, in labor. That, that's the basic structure. And associated with this, production function and conditional in a particular choice of suppliers, there's a marginal cost expression, which as usual falls in productivity and is then some mixture between the cost of labor, uh, which is the wage, and the prices set by other sectors in the economy, conditional on you choosing to buy inputs uh, from those uh, sectors. Now, this equation summarizes the entire novel mechanism, which drives everything in my paper. So in states of the world, when you choose to buy a lot of inputs, when this product is very long, the marginal cost becomes function of more prices, which strengthens complementarities in price setting and hence amplifies non-neutrality of money. So that's what's uh, driving everything. And finally, you need to actually choose the set of suppliers and you do that to minimize uh, the marginal cost. As for the pricing problem, there are only two periods in the model. So tomorrow firms will adjust prices for sure. So they only want to maximize their contemporaneous uh, profits, which yields a very simple optimal reset price expression, which is just a fixed markup over the marginal cost. But then there is a sector specific culver lottery going on. So within every sector, any given firm has some random probability one minus alpha of actually setting your price at the optimal reset level and the rest set it at some exogenously given level pk0. Finally, the household side is very standard in this model. So households have standard log linear utility where aggregate consumption is just um, a simple sort of Cobb-Douglas aggregator with sectoral varieties. 
then to introduce monetary policy in this model, I impose a cash and advance constraint on uh, kind of total nominal uh, demand. And the only shock which is actually hitting my economy is a money supply shock. So the central bank sort of does this intervention here through a shock uh, to money supply so that the money supply in period one is a product of some exogenous initial uh, money supply and the shock which arises. So that's the entire model. And all in all, we can summarize this whole structure into a simple fixed point problem. So every sectoral price is a function of all other prices in the economy, conditional on you choosing to buy from those sectors. And how you choose those depends on what minimizes your cost. So that, that's, that's the uh, structure. Finally, this fixed point problem has nice properties, namely equilibrium exists, prices are unique, and uh, the choices of uh, suppliers are generically unique. That's, that's the structure. So I'm gonna start off by actually studying the baseline of this economy or the steady state uh, of this economy. And given the shock is zero, everything is pinned down by two quantities. So it's the productivity mapping, which is exogenous, and the initial level of money supply. And of course, as I vary my productivity mapping and my uh, initial level of money supply, I can consider uh, different steady states and different steady kind of states of the world to which a shock later arrives. So before introducing formal results, let's just consider a simple uh, two sector example. So imagine I only have two sectors in the economy. They cannot buy inputs from each other. Uh, so, so from themselves, so they can only buy inputs from the other sector. If they choose not to buy anything from anyone, they get a productivity of one. If they choose to buy something from the other sector, they get some productivity A bar, which you can vary and then study what happens as you vary this A bar. And then sector one is purely price flexible and sector two is a semi price flexible. So with a probability a half, any firm will not get a chance to reset their price. So because this example is very stylized, there are only four possibilities for equilibrium networks in this world. So it's either completely empty networks and no one buys from anyone, or sector one doesn't buy anything from the other sector, sector two does, uh, or vice versa. And with each of those, you can write down the marginal costs, and then given the values of initial money supply and initial level of productivity, you can see what's your baseline uh, network. So let's first fix the initial money supply at some constant and vary the A bar parameter. So you vary the productivity map. Whenever this A bar is low, so it's zero, for example, you are in a state with low productivity and the sectors optimally choose not to buy anything from each other. When you increase it a tiny bit, the sticky price sector decides to buy inputs from the flexible price sector. Why? Because as you increase this productivity, the price of the flexible sector falls by enough to incentivize the sticky sector to buy from it to lower his marginal cost. But it's not enough for it to happen the other way around. So the sticky price sector is unable to change the price by enough to incentivize the flexible sector to buy from it. But then if you increase this A bar parameter by enough, you would also incentivize the flexible sector to buy from the sticky price sector. So all in all, as you improve the productivity mapping, as you make the state of the world better and better and better in terms of productivity, you are getting more and more linkages because firms always want to benefit from the lower prices and the lower productivity. Now let's fix the productivity mapping and instead vary the initial level of money supply. So whenever the initial level of money supply is very low at zero, again, no one wants to buy it from anyone. When you increase it a tiny bit, what happens is that wages are just one for one, but the prices in the sticky sector are just by less than one for one, which makes it optimal for the flexible sector to substitute away from in-house labor towards inputs bought from sector two. It's cost minimizing. And then 
as you increase the money supply by even more, both sectors want to buy from each other. So all in all, as you increase the initial level of money supply, uh, the number of linkages grows because under nominal rigidities, price is always adjusting by less than wages, which incentivizes you to substitute in-house labor for more intermediate inputs. And then you can formalize this uh, using com monotone competitive static results, such that if you consider any two baseline pairs of productivity and money supply, such that either the productivity mapping is better or the money supply is higher, you would always get uh, more linkages in steady state. So every sector would be buying from more other sectors in this steady state equilibrium. All right, so this was just the steady state result. And now conditioning on a particular steady state, I perturb it with the monotone shock. So in terms of its mechanics, what happens following a monitor shock is actually very similar to varying the baseline level of money supply. So following, say, an expansionary monitor shock, wages adjust much faster than prices, which encourages you to have weekly more supplies. And it's also weekly expansionary uh, for every sector. Now, because this relationship in of steady stage or equilibrium uh, supply sectors with uh, monitor shock is weak, I can actually distinguish between two types of monitor shock. So with respect to a particular baseline, I define the monitor shock to be small if it leaves the equilibrium network unchanged relative to the baseline. So it's just not big enough to affect equilibrium set of supplies. And otherwise, I call it large. And then I study subsequently both small and large. So let's begin with uh, small monitor shocks. So again, the ones that do not affect the shape of the network. And let's return to the simple two sector examples. So if this shock arrives in a recessionary state of the world when there are no linkages across sectors, only the sticky sector responds to the monitor shock, but not the flexible one because it adjusts prices one thing. But if the same shock arrives in an expansionary state of the world, when both sectors are connected to each other, firstly, the flexible price sector responds to the monetary shock. And then the sticky sector responds by more than it was responding before. And both of those are because of extra complementarities in price setting created by these uh, linkages. So whenever the same shock arrives in a state of the world with more linkages, driven, for example, by higher productivity, you get a higher resp uh, response of GDP. And it can, again, do the simple two-sector example, now a very initial level of money supply. So if the same shock arrives under initial tight money, there are no linkages and only the sticky sector responds. If the same shock arrives in a state of the world when money is already loose, so the money supply is already high, both sectors buy from each other, and both sectors respond. And even the sticky sector responds by more. So the logic is similar. If the same shock arrives in a state of the world with high initial level of money supply, it will be arriving under more linkages, and complementarities in price setting that are stronger will be amplifying the response of GDP to that shock. So you can actually formalize this result by noticing that the difference between consumption responses to a monetary shock which arrives under specific baseline, so either with upper bars or lower bars. So the difference between consumption responses between any two baselines is driven by differences between Leontiev inverses associated with equilibrium networks. And we know that, for example, in states of the world with a better productivity mapping, the input-output network will have no more non-zero entries, so it will be more linkages. And hence, the difference between the Leontief inverses would be such that the consumption response is uh, stronger. And again, whenever you have two states of the world, such that in one of them, the initial level of money supply is higher, the input-output table will have no, more non-zero entries, which means the difference between the Leontief inverses would be such that the consumption response would be stronger uh, in states with higher initial money supply. So those were all uh, small shocks. 
now we can briefly look at what happens when the shocks are large. So they're big enough to affect the shape of the network. And again, we'll begin with a simple two sector example. Imagine I begin in this corner when money supply is zero, and I hit my system with larger and larger shocks and record the response of consumption. So I begin with an empty network and up to the size of the shock equal to three, the network remains empty and the consumption response just grows linearly in the size of the shock. Later, when the shock is big enough, it encourages the flexible sector to buy from the sticky sector, which adds extra complementarity and the slope increases over here. So consumption starts responding by more than it would if networks remains fixed. And to see that, this dotted line shows what would happen if the network remained empty and will continue to grow linearly in the size of the shock. But here it grows more than proportionately. So in this world, large shocks have a more than proportionate uh, effect on GDP relative to small shocks because they create extra linkages and extra complementarity in price settings. So achieving a given consumption response requires a weaker, smaller uh, intervention from the monetary authority. Now, with large contractions, it's actually the opposite. So imagine I begin in this corner where money supply is eight and the network is full, and I keep contracting my money supply. Originally, when the network doesn't, you know, is not affected by the contraction, again, the response grows just linearly, uh, sorry, you know, the consumption falls linearly in the size of the shock. But then when the contraction is big enough to remove linkages, the response of consumption would be less than proportional to the size of the shock, precisely because this shock is big enough to remove linkages and weaken complementarities. So in this world, although pricing is pure Calvo, so the probability of time, uh, price adjustment is time dependent, large monetary contractions deliver drops in GDP that are less than proportionate than those that would happen under exogenous networks. And again, you can formalize this by establishing bounds. So if you compare response of consumption after a large expansion and the response of consumption after a small expansion, it would always be bigger than the difference between the two shocks times the Leontief inverse associated with the initial network. So in this sense, it's more than proportionate than just the difference in the size of the shock. But then it's bounded from above, essentially by, the, by how many linkages the uh, monetary expansion adds. And to do contractions, it just reverse the signs. So it's now bounded from above by just the difference between the contractions times the original network, and is bounded from below by how many linkages we remove. And in the remaining time I have, I just want to briefly walk you through some of the empirical evidence on this mechanism. So all of the results rely on the extent to which you use being intermediates being for cyclical. And as you can see in the simple chart, the cost share of intermediate inputs in the US drops very sharply in recessionary episodes. So whenever you have a recession, you substitute away from intermediates and towards labor. And what I do in the paper is I construct such measures of intensities at the level of individual sectors, or 65 of them. And I study the responses of those intensities to identified shocks. In particular, I study TFP shocks to kind of match productivity changes and Roma Roma shocks to match changes in monetary condition. And I can do this both in a linear setting and also in a nonlinear setting, allowing for sign and size effects, because in my model, you know, there's no clear linear prediction you know, between the network and the size of the chain. And the kind of basic results show that following both a productivity expansion and a monitor easing, the relying on intermediates increases. So after a 1% productivity expansion, you increase your reliance on intermediates by about 0.04 and similarly after 100 basis points easing. But then once you allow for these sign and size effects, the, the uh, kind of um, magnitudes first they amplify by a lot. So now, for example, after a 3% TFP uh, expansion, 
you're increasing your reliance by 0 0.06. So it's a lot more. And such size effects are statistically significant at pretty much all horizons. And then there's a symmetry in the response. So a productivity contraction does not deliver as big of a fall in reliance on intermediates as a productivity expansion does in the positive direction. So it's much harder to break the network than it is to build up new linkages. And this sign effect is also significant at pretty much all horizons. And very similar patterns actually seen when it comes to monetary shocks. So large shocks, large monetary easings build up a lot more reliance on intermediates than monetary contractions of the same magnitude doing the opposite direction. And these sign effects are significant. All right, I think that's all I have the time for today. So I developed a sticky price uh, model with input output linkages that are formed endogenously by front decision. There's a novel uh, mechanism which this framework generates, namely the state dependence in the strength of complementarities in price setting driven by the changes in the network shape. And there's novel empirical evidence which supports uh, this mechanism. And as I said, there's a lot more in the paper, namely I develop a numerical uh, algorithm to solve a forward-looking version of this model for an arbitrary number of sectors. In my paper, I do 389. And then there's more econometric evidence at different margins of adjustment. So I also look at firm level linkages and how they respond to shocks and also at more granular responses at the level of individual subsectors. And this is part of an ongoing agenda where I'm extending this to an open economy setting where monetary transmission would vary under different degree of openness, depending how much you trade with the rest of the world. But that's all I have time for today and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, this is uh, this is looking great. Uh, and I think we have very interesting discussions. I will pass on to Elisa now for her presentations and we take uh, questions from the chat later. Perfect. All right. So thank you, Rafael. And thank you very much to the organizers for including the paper on the program. Uh, so as you can see from my title, I am going to deviate slightly from the Phillips curve topic of the previous two papers. And I am going to look at monetary transmission from a slightly different angle, that is uh, money and spending multipliers. So in benchmark models uh, that we have to think of money and spending multipliers, uh, the economy uh, has a representative agent and only one sector of production. Um, this in work, including a nice paper uh, by Rafael, um, has um, extended this model to uh, include an input output network. Uh, and in fact, this paper showed that uh, targeted spending in, uh, with an input output network can increase the spending multiplier. These results are uh, mostly derived in a quantitative setup. Um, and so what I do in this paper is instead I take a theoretical approach, which allows me to generalize a bit these results and extend them, and also to uh, clarify uh, the mechanism uh, from which they come. So um, let me start by setting a benchmark, which is a representative agent model with an input output network. So um, it is a known result that in this kind of model, the presence of uh, intermediate inputs flattens the Phillips curve. And so there is more uh, monetary non-neutrality. A less emphasized result is that actually with a representative agent, there is not much action on the spending multiplier side. So essentially the spending multiplier is the same function of the slope of the Phillips curve and the policy rule as in a um, one sector model. Things change and become a lot more interesting when instead we have heterogeneous agents. And in particular, um, the key element that uh, generates all the action is that these agents uh, face different nominal and real rigidities. So by different nominal rigidities, I mean that uh, some uh, agents have stickier wages or they work for sectors with stickier prices and so on. And by different real rigidities, essentially I am referring to uh, factor supply elasticities. So some agents might have more or less elastic labor supply and sectors might, might rely more or less on fixed factors. So within this uh, setup, I, uh, I asked two questions. Uh, first, is how does policy redistribute uh, across these agents? 
And second is, uh, does heterogeneity in nominal and real rigidities affect the response of aggregate uh, macroeconomic variables to uh, monetary policy and government spending? So to address these questions, I revisit uh, the money and spending multiplier in this multi-agent, multi-sector model. So now the money multiplier is going to be a multi-dimensional object that tells us how the employment of each agent, H, depends on money supply. What I find is that in the cross-section, employment increases more after a monetary expansion for those people who face stronger nominal rigidities and weaker real rigidities. So sticky wage agents uh, or agents with more elastic labor supply are going to benefit more in terms of employment from a monetary expansion. And this is intuitive because essentially what happens is the price of the goods that they produce, the relative price is going to fall. And so demand for these goods and hence for these labor services is going to increase. Importantly, this cross-sectional pattern has an interesting aggregate implication, which is that the ability of the economy to substitute towards these agents that essentially have a flatter Phillips curve increases the aggregate uh, monetary non-neutrality. Right, so for a given uh, monetary expansion, we have a larger uh, effect on employment. Um, the second set of results is going to be about the spending multiplier. So again, the spending multiplier is a multidimensional object. Uh, it tells us how the employment of, the, of each agent depends on spending on each sector. So the key innovation with respect to the um, representative agent model is that now spending is going to potentially affect the relative demand for different workers. And in fact, the only uh, case where this does not happen, I will show you, is when spending exactly replicates the aggregate private consumption basket. And in this case, the spending multiplier is going to have the same form as in a representative agent model. Uh, instead, the aggregate uh, employment multiplier is going to be larger when spending is directed towards agents with flatter Phillips curve. And by contrast, the composition of government spending is going to be irrelevant for the aggregate employment only if all agents face the same nominal and real rigidities. Um, and a, a simple example is this is an economy with uh, flexible prices, no fixed factors, and uniform labor supply elasticities. So this is an important result because it tells us where we find the heterogeneity that matters. So we could have a super complicated network with many sectors that interact in complicated ways, but as long as sectors have not, use no fixed factors and workers have the same supply elasticity and prices are flexible, then we know that any allocation of spending is going to deliver the same effect on aggregate employment. All right, so let me skip the literature in the interest of time. Um, so in this presentation, I will give you a sense of uh, the setup I am working with. Uh, then I will give you uh, an overview of how I derive money and spending multipliers from intersecting the demand and supply blocks of the model. And this, I hope, is going to clarify where heterogeneity matters and when instead it doesn't matter. So to, to illustrate this, I will show you two as-if results that show you two eco shows two economies where um, the composition of spending doesn't matter or where the multiplier is the same as with a representative agent. And finally, I will try to spend a bit more time uh, on two examples uh, uh, that illustrate the role of um, heterogeneous wage rigidity and fixed factors for, uh, for the spending money and spending multipliers. All right, so let me start with the setup. Um, as I anticipated, we will have many agents and many workers, so and many sectors. So it's going to be age agents and production sectors, and sectors also use uh, fixed factors. Uh, agents are different in that they consume different bundles of goods, they own different shares of sectors and fixed factors, and they also face different wage rigidity and have different labor supply elasticity. Sectors are different because they hire different bundles of workers and fixed factors and intermediate inputs. And they also face different price agility and different demand elasticity. To solve the model, I will uh, log linearize it. Uh, and the log linearized model has a the nice characteristic that its evolution is described by a relatively small set of measurable uh, steady state shares and elasticities. 
Um, and so the model can be uh, quite easily taken to the data, and I will say a few words about this at the end. Oops, sorry, I skipped too far. Um, all right, so uh, the consumer side of the model is fairly standard. Um, the preferences are, as you can see them uh, on the slide, uh, the only uh, things that I want you to pay attention to is are that, well, first, um, the wealth effects uh, in labor supply, uh, gamma and the elasticity can uh, differ across agents, and that's what delivers uh, different uh, labor supply elasticities. And second, the consumption bundles can also be different. Um, so this gives rise to different equilibrium consumption shares, that is what I call beta in my notation. Um, the production side um, is, uh, as in the usual input-output models, um, production functions here are very general. Uh, they can take as inputs uh, any combination of the various labor types and uh, fixed factors, and they also use intermediate inputs. So this gives rise to uh, sec uh, sector level factor shares that they call alpha that uh, capture the importance of uh, labor and fixed factors in production of each sector. And then uh, there's going to be input output shares uh, omega. The only real restriction that they put on production function is that they must have constant returns to scale. Um, to model price rigidities, I use the traditional uh, Calvo trick um, I assume that there is a continuum of firms within sectors, and only a fraction delta of these firms can uh, adjust their price after they see monetary policy and government spending. And so in my notation, the price adjustment probabilities are going to be uh, called delta. And just as a quick note, uh, I model uh, CK wages in the same way. There's going to be many labor unions, and they, uh, only a fraction of them can adjust the wage that they charge. Uh, in terms of policy instruments, there are two key instruments. First, the central bank uh, can uh, set the level of nominal GDP, uh, which must be equal to uh, the aggregate money supply. And this is given by uh, private consumption plus government spending. And a second, precisely the central bank can choose uh, the amount of government spending uh, on each sector. All right, so now whenever you see G, this is going to be uh, a vector that tells us how much uh, we are spending on each sector. All right, so uh, this was the setup. Let me give you a bird's eye view of the derivation of multipliers. Um, so money and spending multipliers uh, come from intersecting the demand and supply blocks of the model. Uh, so here, um, the, the, these two blocks are given by three equations. And let me walk you briefly through uh, those. So the supply equation is quite standard. It comes from the uh, agent's consumption leisure trade-off. And the only difference with respect to the uh, representative agent model is that now we have one such condition for each agent. But uh, the form and the derivation is similar. Then we have a second condition that, tells, that pins down aggregate demand. So this is going to tell us that aggregate prices times aggregate output, which equals aggregate uh, labor supply, is going to be um, equal to aggregate GDP that is pinned down by the central bank. Finally, we have a new equation that is uh, novel to the heterogeneous agent model that tells us that actually um, changes in policy uh, are also going to affect the relative demand for different workers. So here we see uh, that the relative uh, demand for labor is going to depend on the relative factor prices and on government spending. So these uh, D uh, objects in the relative demand equation uh, cover up a lot of, a lot of things, but uh, let me tell you, they depend on two uh, main channels. The first is changes in the composition of final demand, which can come from government spending or changes in private incomes to the extent that uh, different agents consume different baskets. And the second channel is substitution. So a change in factor prices will uh, make people demand more of the uh, factors that have become cheaper. All right, so, oops. Um, so, oh, sorry, I feel like, okay, great. So uh, another important note um, is that, as you can see, uh, money supply only enters the uh, aggregate demand equation on impact, whereas government spending only affects the relative demand for different people. 
Uh, as you will see, however, uh, money supply will also have a spillover on relative demand and vice versa, government spending will propagate uh, into aggregate demand. So by intersecting the two blocks, supply and demand of the model, uh, we can derive the multiplier. So let me start from the money multiplier. The, the key uh, step to understand money multiplier is to understand how printing money affects uh, factor prices. So in a representative agent model, essentially printing money would increase all prices uh, proportionately. Um, so that's what captured by this uh, one term here. However, uh, in the multi-agent model, uh, as soon as agents face different um, nominal or real rigidities, then a proportional increase in factor prices also generates an imbalance in factor markets. And just to get some intuition, uh, this is going uh, in, in, in a proportionate increase in, in all wages is going to generate excess demand for workers who have uh, inelastic labor supply. Um, but also for workers who are employed by sectors with stickier prices or sectors that employ fewer fixed factors because the price of uh, these sectors is going to increase by less. So to rebalance factor markets, uh, we need to have a change in relative wages, which is what's captured by this blue term. Uh, and in turn, as I will show you later, this change in relative wages will imply um, that there are aggregate uh, effects uh, on overall employment. Uh, the spending multiplier uh, comes from the same um, equilibrium equations, and we can already see from the system that uh, the multiplier, we can already see from the system, system the first as if result that I mentioned before. Essentially, the spending multiplier is going to be the same as in a representative agent model, only when uh, spending does not affect the relative demand for different workers. And as I show in the paper, this happens if and only if spending replicates the aggregate consumption basket. So in this case, oh goodness, in this case, uh, the spending multiplier is the same, has exactly the same expression as uh, in the representative agent model. And essentially it works very well perfecting labor supply. People are taxed uh, and so they, um, they can uh, consume less per unit labor and hence they supply more labor. Otherwise, if uh, spending uh, does not replicate the aggregate uh, consumption basket, then it is going to affect um, the equilibrium in factor markets. And therefore, it's going to trigger a relative wage adjustment. Uh, and that's what captured in the blue term here. And what I'll show you next is that, uh, what I'll show you next is when this has an impact on aggregate employment. So let me start uh, with a result that characterizes the, situa the situations in which this has no impact. And essentially, these are economies where all agents face the same nominal and real rigidities. So uh, for example, this is achieved, as we said before, when all agents have the same labor supply elasticities, there are no fixed factors and prices are flexible. So in this economy, re regardless of how complicated the input output network is, the aggregate uh, employment multiplier is only going to depend on total spending and not on the composition of spending across sectors. Uh, however, these are very, this is a very special economy and in general we don't have this amount of symmetry. So heterogeneity will matter for uh, aggregate outcomes. And let me illustrate this through um, two simple examples. So the first example, just to make things a bit more concrete, I'm going to call, you, I call it Italy versus Germany. So we have uh, two, the two countries are these uh, yellow dots. Uh, each country has a separate uh, group of workers. And uh, these two workers are employed by uh, a, a pro the same production sector that delivers the final good that is the same in the two countries, just to keep things simple. Uh, so what happens in this economy after there is a, a monetary expansion. Well, essentially, let's first look in the cross section. Essentially, what happens is that the monetary expansion is going to benefit in terms of employment, the workers with uh, stickier wages. So to the extent that we think that Italian wages are stickier than German wages, then Italy is going to benefit more from an expansion and lose more from a contraction. Um, and uh, I, I would like to uh, raise your attention to the fact that this, this, this entirely works through a substitution channel. So um, 
the wage of Italian workers doesn't respond as much to the expansion, so Italian workers become cheaper, uh, and therefore producers and consumers substitute towards these workers. This cross-sectional pattern has an important aggregate uh, uh, implication, that is the ability of consumers and producers to substitute towards the cheaper workers, so the sticky workers, uh, increases the amount of monetary non-neutrality. So essentially, this tells us that demand in the economy has shifted towards flat Phillips curve workers. And we know that the flatter the Phillips curve, the more monetary non-neutrality we have. All right, so in terms of uh, government spending, following a similar uh, logic as before, aggregate employment is going to increase by more if spending is directed towards the sticky workers. Uh, and again, this is because um, the uh, average uh, real wages are going to increase uh, when spending is directed to the city sectors because the wage of uh, the price of this sector is not going to increase uh, by as much. Uh, and vice versa, uh, real wages are going to fall if spending is directed towards the city sector. Um, all right. um, another way to uh, model uh, different uh, rigidities uh, in different labor market is to assume that um, workers have different labor supply elasticity. And here the intuition is very similar uh, as to the uh, heterogeneous wage rigidity example. So again, a monetary expansion is going to benefit the workers who uh, have more elastic labor supply. And this uh, again is going to work through substitution. So for a given monetary expansion, um, elastic workers are more willing to supply labor. So eventually their relative wage must adjust uh, and be lower than the wage of inelastic workers. Therefore, consumers and producers will substitute towards uh, elastic workers. In the aggregate, the ability to substitute uh, is going to increase uh, the money multiplier. And similarly, government spending is going to have a larger effect on aggregate employment if it is targeted towards workers with more elastic labor supply. So uh, let me conclude uh, with another uh, example that instead illustrates the role of fixed factors. So again, to make this more concrete, uh, let's think about a real estate economy. So we're going to have only, oops, only one consumer, um, only one household, and the household uh, only consumes uh, housing goods. Uh, and these are produced with uh, two inputs, labor that can adjust and lend that is a fixed factor. So the question here is, will the um, money multiplier be uh, larger uh, in the economy with labor and land than it would be uh, in, a, in an economy with only labor? So here, um, the answer is actually it depends. Um, and there is going to be a trade-off between the constraint that uh, the fixed factor land puts on the expansion and the increase in the labor share that is triggered by the monetary expansion. So to make things a bit more concrete, um, suppose that uh, people, whenever they have more money, they really care about building a new home. And so if they don't have the land, then they cannot do it on the, or they have to dig a smaller house, to build a, a smaller house. And so the presence of this fixed factor is going to uh, lead to a smaller multiplier. So the problem here is that labor and land are very complementary. If instead people are okay with uh, just improving their old home, uh, then this means that labor and land are actually quite substitutable. And so a monetary expansion is going to trigger substitution towards labor and increase the labor share. And this is going to lead to a larger uh, money multiplier in the economy with the fixed factor. So another interesting thing that happens in uh, economy uh, with fixed factors is that now we can have interesting uh, forces to determine heterogeneity in the uh, elasticity of employment to monetary policy in different markets. So to illustrate this, um, again, in a concrete example, let's think about New York City uh, versus uh, Boise, Idaho. So um, this example essentially replicates the economy before, split it in two, and so now our household can decide whether it wants to live in New York or in Boise. Uh, and um, New York houses are constructed by people who live in New York and using New York land. And Boise houses are constructed by people who live in Boise and using Boise land. 
so now the question is, is uh, um, does uh, an, an, an ex a monetary expansion uh, generate a larger employment response uh, in uh, New York or in Boise? Well, the answer crucially depends on, the, on what we can call the amount of geographic mobility. So uh, how much people are willing to substitute between living in New York or living in Boise. So uh, in, in this geographic mobility, I'm going to capture in a reduced form uh, through this parameter sigma, which corresponds to the elasticity of substitution between housing in New York and housing uh, in Boise uh, for the household. So um, what the theory tells us uh, is that if people um, are stuck in a location, uh, they really don't want to move, maybe because they need to live where they work, uh, then employment uh, is actually uh, going to be more, cyc more cyclical in New York City. So people are just going to focus on improving their own apartment, so the labor share is going to increase, and uh, more so in New York City because the labor share was smaller to, be, uh, to begin with. If instead people are uh, geographically mobile, say because they can work remotely, whenever they have uh, more money, they just go buy a big house wherever it's cheaper, and that's going to be Boise. So essentially the labor market is going to be more cyclical uh, in Boise in the second case. All right, so uh, if I can stop sleeping slide. Um, all right, so this was uh, all I had for the theory part. Uh, I am still working on the empirical part. So far, I'm constructing a data set for the US that captures all these elements of heterogeneity across sectors and workers. Uh, so here, I just put a hint of the data sources I'm using. Uh, I am less familiar with uh, data for Europe, so I very much welcome welcome any feedback or suggestion uh, afterwards. Um, so uh, to conclude, let me just uh, reiterate the main points of the paper. So uh, here I, I hope today I convinced you that uh, the presence of heterogeneity in nominal and real rigidities across agents is critical for the redistributive and aggregate effects of monetary policy and government spending. In particular, uh, in the cross-section, a monetary expansion is going to redistribute employment towards uh, agents who face stronger nominal rigidities and weaker real rigidities. Um, the flip side of this is that the cyclicality of the price of their good is gonna, the good they produce is going to be smaller. In the aggregate, the ability of the economy to substitute uh, from um, uh, towards agents that have flatter Phillips curve is going to increase monetary non-neutrality. Following the same logic, uh, spending is going to affect uh, labor, uh, aggregate, uh, lab, um, aggregate uh, employment through uh, an effect uh, relative demand. Spending in this case is as if with a representative agent. If instead spending targets workers with flatter Phillips curve, so more nominal rigidity, less real rigidity, uh, then the aggregate employment multiplier is going to be larger. And finally, the composition of spending is going to be relevant in economies where, where all agents face the same rigidities. All right, so thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the Q&A. Um, thank you very much, Lisa, for, for another great presentation. Um, I think there were uh, quite a few questions in the chat, uh, so maybe let me start uh, chronologically a little bit. There were some answers given by uh, Ludwig already, um, so perhaps Ludwig, you, you, you want us to uh, pick up, I will read them briefly because I don't know if everybody can see them, um, and then uh, sort of recap a little bit your responses. Um, so Luca had uh, a question. Just to clarify the, the connection to the result in, in the work by, by Alvarez on the sufficient statistics and how that relates to, to what you find, I think that'd be valuable for, for everybody. Um, maybe let's start with this um, and then I, 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 I um, resummarize the other points and questions. Great, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Rafael. So, um, um, yeah, Luca had a great question on, on that relationship. So, we use the uh, ALL sufficient statistic to um, you know, that is, that is about uh, the equivalence of the cumulative impulse response to a permanent nominal marginal cost shock uh, for Calvo and menu cost models once they have the same kurtosis frequency ratio. 
And so uh, one thing we can do there is we can take the menu cost models square to source frequency ratio and then back out what the frequency of adjustment in the Calvo model has to be so that this cumulative impulse response to a monetary, uh, to a um, permanent nominal cost shock is the same. And then we show, according to our results, that that frequency also matches the, impulse the entire impulse response to an arbitrary nominal cost shock, as well as the impulse, the entire impulse response to an arbitrary real marginal cost shock. So that's sort of broadening the applicability of that result. And that um, allows us to also compute the Phillips curve slope based on that Calvo frequency that sort of equalizes the currency frequency ratios for Calvo and many cost models. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and uh, just to, to follow up here on the second question, um, which was given by Anton Monakov, is to what extent do your, re de do your de derivations rely on the fact that idiosyncratic shocks are random walk? What if they are air one? And how can a Calvo model possibly give the same impulse responses to large shocks when it is linear, or you have an inverted U shape with standing payment pricing in terms of the peak consumption response as a function of the monetary shock size? If you could yeah, just so the, that. yeah, just briefly. So the air one, we haven't actually tried yet. It is incredible air one shocks. We've only worked with random menu cost. My hunch is that it's probably going to be similar, but something more we're going to have to try out. And for large shocks, so um, if you obviously make the shock really large, then the two models are going to differ. But as you know, if the shock is only sort of modestly large, like say five percent, ten percent, then they're still going to be uh, looking relatively, uh, relatively close but obviously not as close as for, for very small shocks. And there was another question. Um, just, I, I try to keep this all focused on, on the paper, I guess here, but from Peter Karadi to you, uh, asking also about shocks uh, to the extent uh, you know, uh, of, on, on, or to, to the class, asking basically to the extent uh, what your conclusions are sensitive uh, about the distribution uh, of idiosyncratic shocks. And if you have, Thought about uh, you know mixtures of, of 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 distributions, or if you sort of actually have assessed the robustness to leptocurtic shocks, uh, which is another, uh, I guess, uh, potentially empirically grounded uh, assumption. Yeah, we actually have done that, and the results still work. Um, they look a tiny bit worse than what we had for um, the Nakamura Steinson model, but still very very close. Uh, we also have looked at multiple products, like in mid against paper. So we also looked at a two product model, and there again, um, they're uh, they're they're very close. But thanks for the question. Okay, and then there were a few questions um, to to Michelle. Um, so um, I, I I suppose I start with uh, Christiane's question, um, whether you can actually say anything about the dynamics um, of inflation over the cycle based on on your model. Do you have any insights there, um, Michelle? Yeah, so thanks a lot for this excellent uh, question. So in, in the model that I've shown, because of the cash and advance constraint, all price dynamics will sort of be the mirror image of the consumption responses, right? So in, the, if in expansions, consumption in consumption or GDP responds more strongly. This means prices would be slower to adjust. So in general, in this model, in any states of the world with more linkages, any price changes would be smaller in response to any shocks, although the frequency of those price changes would be unaffected by the state of the world. So that, that's the basic mechanics uh, in, in this model. And there was also more uh, a, a more basic question, I suppose, from uh, Anton, uh, with, uh, asking um, basically about uh, the assumptions here. here um, sorry, let me see. This question keeps moving up and down here in my chat. Uh, maybe you have to give me one second. Um, uh, so yeah, he's asking whether small or large shocks and running out of steam is delivered uh, delivered naturally by a standard, simple, state-dependent model. So without resorting to in endogenous networks and sort of, how, how, you know, is this sort of like what's the straw man you shoot there, and how how do you um, answer this question? Yeah, uh, so I guess that would be uh, the same just for size dependence, but in the contractionary dimension. So for contractionary monetary shocks, you'd be both running out of steam in the SDP model and under endogenous networks plus, plus caliber, but it would be the opposite for expansionary shocks. So if I get a large monetary expansion, the response of GDP will be more than proportionate. 
Whereas I guess in an SDP model, you'll still be running out of steam in the expansion we mentioned as well. So that's the first answer. And then of course, on, on top of that, I mean, the, the point of um, that exposition was not to say that we should completely abandon, you know, many costs and just, just the endogenous networks to explain all of that. It's just to say that endogenous networks on their own without resorting to any kind of state dependency in the probability of price adjustment, just endogenous networks plus the limit of time dependent pricing is enough to deliver all three nonlinearities. Of course, if you want to see which one is more quantitatively relevant, you need to have a model with both menu costs or like a Calva plus model with endogenous network formation on top of that to see which one of the mechanisms is more important for nonlinearities. Um, yeah, great. Thanks. And then one final question to you, uh, which I'm reading from uh, Manu Fairman is, um, would a large monetary expansion in itself be sufficient to increase the degree of interlinkages and the real effects of monetary policy, or would this require a monetary expansion that exerts, oh, sorry, the chat just moved, so, uh, that, uh, uh, that exerts a large initial effect on aggregate demand, this distinction could be important in CLB times, or if monetary policy were to be weaker. Yeah, so in theory, from the theoretical standpoint, just the large monetary expansion itself self amplifies itself by creating these extra linkages. Now, the question is how quantitatively relevant uh, that is relative to the other nonlinearities. So this third channel of self amplification in the calibrated setting tends to be the least quantitatively relevant. Now, if you talk about ZLB, for example, if um, this deep recession is caused by, you know, real factors, then in that uh, recession, the effect of being in an environment with very few linkages would dominate the self amplification effect. So, this uh, large monetary expansion, even if it's very large, in a recession would still be relatively weak quantitatively because it happens under a few linkages. And the, the extra linkages added by the large expansion would quantitatively not be enough to compensate for the linkages destroyed by the real recession. That, that's the kind of uh, trade off there. But that's the, again coming from the quantitative big model, which I haven't shown you today, but in the paper it's reported. Okay, well, thank you also for, for this answer. I um, believe uh, I, I'll then ask a question to, to Elisa. Um, so I think, like the other papers, this is super in interesting actually. And I, 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 I assume you had only enough time to talk about mostly monetary shocks. Uh, um, but, you know, in some sense, I think this opens up a lot of questions um, for for empirical research, also, right? And I believe this is why you're collecting this very rich data set. Um, you know, ultimately, the question is how do you actually identify shocks being idiosyncratic or aggregate? You know, because they could be idiosyncratic shocks, or it's very hard to identify um, what a, what an aggregate shock is if there's heterogeneity across sectors that makes it look very idiosync potentially idiosyncratic. Is there any and anything that at this early stage you can can say, or any insights that can be useful for uh, for empirical work, trying to pin down the sources of fluctuations. Yeah, that's right. So I I am working on that. In fact, um, so from a very intuitive point of view, um, as you said, it is very important to distinguish whether variation comes from aggregate or idiosyncratic shocks. And in fact, um, so what I have so far is more of a negative result, if you want, um, that is the same cross-sectional moment informs you about very different parameters, uh, depending on whether it is generated by an uh, idiosyncratic uh, shock or by an aggregate shock. Um, and so this kind of, in a way, is a bit of a negative result for cross-sectional analysis. However, um, a more constructive result that I'm working on is, um, well, to the extent that we have information about uh, the structure of the model. So say we know the, all the shares that I showed you in the slides, like input shares, um, consumption shares, and so on, then we can lever up a bit on this structure to tease out what the underlying shocks could be. And to the extent that we cannot do this because we do not have enough variation in the data, we can still kind of construct a confidence set for the parameters. 
So say, all right, if the variation comes from idiosyncratic shock, then this is what we estimate. If instead the variation comes from aggregate shock, this is the implication. So in a way, it is true that the model tells us, well, the implications are very different in the two cases, but it also allows us to tell, well, given an estimated moment, what are the implications in each case? And that can still be informative. OK, well, thank you so much for, for, the, for this answer. I think there's a, uh, this, I, this is very exciting to see all these three papers. And I think they all have something really important to say on how we should think about uh, understanding the, the economy. Uh, I will try to finish exactly on, uh, almost exactly on time. Uh, we have uh, about a 15 minute break and uh, we reconvene for uh, the next uh, keynote at one o'clock by Amy Nakamura. So thank you all very, very much for these excellent presentations. Um, and uh, I uh, hope to see you in, in person at some point soon. <laughs>